Hello, and welcome back to Introduction to Genetics and Evolution. In the previous two videos, we talked about the effects of genetic drift over single generations and over multiple generations. Just to stress some of the points I raised there, in single generation, genetic drift is about equally likely to make alleles increase as decrease in frequency. Okay? Over multiple generations, genetic drift can be somewhat predictable in that we expect the probability of eventual fixation, eventually getting to 100% for any variable allele, is equal to the frequency of that allele in the population. What we're going to do now is look at the effects of genetic drift on the rate of neutral molecular evolution. And this is something that's fundamentally important and will tie in with our next set of videos on molecular evolution. Now again, are the long-term effects of mutations in genetic drift predictable? Well, we've already talked about mutations arising at some rate, that there's some predictable rate at which new mutations can occur. Right? Now, some uh, parts of the genome will get mutations that have no effect on fitness. Right? Or some mutations may arise in a part of the genome that can have an effect on fitness, but the mutation itself doesn't affect fitness. In these cases, these mutations are referred to as neutral. They have no effect on fitness after they arise. They can spread by genetic drift, or they may be lost by genetic drift. Now the question is, can we predict the rate at which they both arise and spread to fixation? This is what ultimately will lead to differences between species, right? That a new mutation arises, it spreads in one lineage, gets to 100%. That makes that lineage different from other lineages because it has this unique variant there. Well, can we, can we determine this rate at which they arise and spread? Well, the tricky part is the ancient population sizes are unknown. So it makes it seem like this would be very challenging. Well, let's break this up into pieces. So mutations are arising, and let's say they arise at a rate which we'll refer to as mu. Right? This is the Greek letter mu. So this mu can be measured perhaps in, as mutations per year or as mutations per generation. We'll focus primarily on the per year side of this video. So let's imagine that our mutation rate is 1 times 10 to the minus 9 mutations per year per base pair study. That's not a crazy estimate. That's, that's about what you'd expect to see. Now, in larger populations, you're more likely to get the mutation simply because there's more alleles present, right? That every chromosome out there has some probability of getting the mutation. The more chromosomes you have, the more chance is that the mutation will arise. So the rate of getting a new mutation in a population might be 2n mu, right? So 2n is the number of chromosomes because n is the population size, 2 because it's diploid, every individual has two copies of it, and mu is that rate per chromosome. So it's a rate per year per base pair studied on an individual chromosome. Now, the mutation must also fix by genetic drift. It has to go from this you know, rare starting frequency all the way up to 100%. So what is the probability of fixation of a new mutation in a diploid? Well, we talked about the rate, or I'm sorry, we talked about the probability of fixation of alleles by genetic drift, right? Well, let's break, let's put these two pieces together. The probability of a new mutation arising, we said it's 2n mu, the probability of a new mutation fixing will be equal to its starting frequency. The starting frequency of a new mutation will always be 1 over 2n. This is very important, 1 over 2n. Because this new mutation has arisen in the population, the population is diploid, and there's only one copy of the new mutation. So it's one mutation in this population of 2n chromosomes. All right, so this is its starting frequency, and as we said before, by genetic drift alone, this is a probability that it'll eventually fix. Right? The probability of fixation is equal to the allele frequency. So what we're saying is the probability of new mutation arising times the probability of new mutation fixing. We put these things together, and we have a mathematical convenience. 2n mu times 1 over 2n, we can cancel these out, is equal to mu. <laughs> so this is really cool, because large populations have more chance the mutation will arise but a smaller chance that it'll actually fix by genetic drift because the allele frequency at the start is so much lower. In contrast, um, smaller populations have a lower chance the mutation will arise, but have a higher chance it will fix because that starting allele frequency is high. Because of this uh, amazing canceling out, the rate of neutral molecular evolution does not depend on population size. This was uh, first described by Motu Kimura, whose picture is shown here. So how can we use this calculation? Well, here's an application for it. Let's say that we know the mutation rate of a particular region. Let's say we know the mutation rate for human pseudogenes is roughly 1 times 10 to the minus 9th mutations per year per base pair. Okay. 
So we, let's say we want to know the divergent, divergence time between humans and mouse lemurs. There's an interesting picture of a mouse lemur over here. So what we do is we sequence a particular pseudogene. A pseudogene, by the way, is, is a gene that is no longer functional. So it's assumed that mutations that arise in it are going to be uh, neutral. They're not, they're not going to have any effect on fitness. You sequence the pseudogene and you find 150 base differences in 1,000 base pairs between the human and mouse lemur. Okay? This is not unusual. You expect several uh, DNA, dif uh, DNA sequence differences between humans and mouse lemurs. We're not that closely related. Well, we can use this to determine how far back humans and mouse lemurs shared a common ancestor. Let me show you how we do this. So again, we have this rate, 1 times 10 to the minus 9th mutations per base pair per, per year. Now, in this case, we said we were looking at 1,000 base pairs. So our probability of getting mutations is higher, right? It'll be 1,000 times more. So we can say 1 times 10 to the minus 6th mutations in 1,000 base pairs. I just multiplied 10 to the minus 9th times 1,000. So 1 times 10 to the minus 6th mutations in 1,000 base pairs per year. And what we can do is basically just invert this, okay? So we should say that for every uh, one mutation in 1,000 base pairs, we can say it's been about 10 to the 6th years. I just inverted the numbers up here, okay? So we saw 150 mutations. So 150 mutations times 10 to the 6th years per mutation. So that comes out to 1.5 times 10 to the 8th years of total divergence. This seems like it should be the right answer, right? Because this, this is saying this is how long we should have gotten, it should have taken for us to get this 150 mutations. The problem is there's two branches. So here's our common ancestor in time. So here's today, here's long ago. So we have this change over time. We have these 150 mutations that distinguish us. Now some of these mutations are on this lineage, but some of them are also on this lineage. So when we're saying this 1.5 times 10 to the eighth years, we're actually summing both of these things together. So what we need to do is we actually need to divide by 2. So we take 1.5 times 10 to the 8th years, divide it by 2, and that becomes 7.5 times 10 to the 7th years. Or the time to the ancestor would be 75 million years ago. So as long ago we can say is roughly 75 million years ago. Okay. Take a second just to look that over. And I'll give you one to try on your own. So we start with this, you know, mutations per base pair per year. That was a given. We then looked at how big a sequence we were looking at, 1,000 base pairs. We flipped this number around, basically from 1 times 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the 6. We basically just changed it so years was in the numerator and uh, one mutation in the denominator. That made it 10 to the 6. So, so for every one mutation, we have to wait 10 to the 6th years. We have 150 mutations. So we multiply that times 10 to the 6th. This is where we get 1.5 times 10 to the 8th. We had to divide by 2 because mutations are arising along both lineages. We're not looking at base differences between humans and the ancestor. We're looking at base difference between humans and mouse lemur. That's why we have to divide by two, and therefore we get 75 million years. There's one for you to try. Here's the time to, what is the time to ancestor for a human to tamarin? Let's assume the same mutation rate there. Let's say in this case you screen 10,000 base pairs of sequence, okay, just so you're not using exactly the same numbers. Let's say you found 860 mutations. What would the divergence time be? Well, I hope that wasn't too challenging. Now, let me walk you through this one, just like we did the previous one. So this is just filling in those same things. So we said uh, that we're looking at 10,000 base pairs. That's the same as 10 to the fourth um, base pairs. So 10 to the fourth times 1 times 10 to the minus ninth. So that would be 1 times 10 to the minus fifth mutations in 10,000 base pairs. All right. So all I do is just multiply 10 to the minus ninth by 10,000. Then I invert this whole thing, so I have uh, years in the numerator and mutations in the denominator, so we have to wait 10 to the 5th years for every one mutation in this 10,000 base pairs. Okay, so this is a longer stretch, that's why we're, we don't have to wait as long for it. We have 860 mutations, so we multiply these two together, and we get 8.6 times 10 to the 7th, or 86 million. Now again, this 86 million is reflecting what's happened in this branch and what's happened in this branch. So we divide by 2. So the time to our common ancestor would be half that, or 4.3 times 10 to the 7th, or 43 million years ago. 43 million years ago is when we may have shared a common ancestor with humans in Tamarin. Now several people have told me they're very interested in these uh, divergence time estimates and calculating them from molecular data. If you're interested in looking up some published divergence time estimates, I refer you to this website timetree.org. They also have a free iPhone app where you can just type in your favorite two species and see what the estimated divergence time is between them. So take a look at that when you have a chance. Now I'd like to do a little segue into what's going to be coming up in the next set of videos.
Now, nucleotide variation exists within species and between species. So let's say, for example, you sequenced a uh, stretch from four individuals of species one, four individuals of species two. So this may be human and tamarind, for example. There are some bases, like, for example, base number one here, where every individual from species one differs from every individual from species two. Right? All individual species one have a C, all individuals from species two have a G. So this is some sort of fixed difference. Okay? We may have cases where one species is variable and the other is not, and that's what we see with both uh, bases two and three. In this case, this particular uh, site, site labeled number two, is variable in species one, whereas it is invariant in species two. And this one here, this one is variable in species two, but invariant in species one. It's, var it's variable, but there's only one rare, rare variant here, at least among these individuals. Now, a big question out there, we see this variation within species, we see variation between species, so between species would be these, these would be within species. The question is, where does this come from? Now, some mutations are advantageous, and we expect those to spread within species, and probably spread fairly quickly. Many mutations are bad, and even if they're bad, they may be still found in the population for a short period of time. You saw a genetic drift in particular can allow some bad mutations to stick around for quite a while. <coughs> so the question is, how much of the genome actually evolves solely by a mutation and genetic drift in this purely neutral fashion? Right? How much of this is actually being affected by natural selection? Well, there's two sort of schools of thought that have been around since 1960s or so. One is the neutralist school of thought. And that is that most of the nucleotide variation that you see present within species tends to be neutral. Okay? So most of the variation you see there within species tends to be neutral. In contrast, Selectionists suggest that very little nucleotide variation is neutral. That if you see multiple variants, it could be something like, for example, overdominance. Or it could be that particular variants are selected in this population and other variants are selected in that population, so both types stick around. How much of the variation that's out there is actually selected? How much of it is neutral? This is a very big question, and it's not something to which there are very clear answers to just yet. We'll come back to this when we start looking at patterns of molecular evolution. Hope you'll join us. Thanks for listening.